but when I come here, it makes me realize that, you know, Jesus said that it's not just the ones that we want to get saved, it's everybody. Mm. And I love the, the heart of Pastor Matthew and the leaders here because, to be honest with you, this to me is the closest thing to Jesus' heart. You guys are so loved, right, and so cherished that if only you could realize how much you were, that Jesus himself died for you. It is beautiful. You know, I'm from a place called Broken Hill. Has anyone heard of Broken Hill? <laughs> well, that's interesting. Has anyone heard of Wilkenya? Yes, been there. Right, well, I was born in Wilkenya. Really? So my pop uh, grandfather was uh, German and my nana was Aboriginal. And a la butter peanut butter sandwiches. <laughs> Voila, here I am. <laughs> now, I got brought up on the wild side of the track, and so a lot of my upbringing was around pubs. So we didn't sort of sit at the kitchen table as a family with mum and dad. Um, we were going from place to place, event to event, whether it was the backyard with a dunk pool, motorbikes and push bikes, while they had the country music set up and everyone was getting absolutely sloshed and maggoty drunk. So in that time, obviously, you know, I was sexually abused and uh, there was no right or wrong. There was no teaching or education as to what someone should do or what they shouldn't do. So boundaries to me were very non-existent. And so half the time I had to, I had to roam around town just to find out where my mother was. Because I'd go home after playing with the kids. She wouldn't leave me a note saying, oh, look, I'm down at Arnie such and such or uncle blah, blah, blah. And so I'd actually had to search the whole town to find out where my mum was. And I can tell you as a little boy, um, abandonment doesn't just exist when you're outside of your family. Abandonment exists when you feel like you go home and no one's there for you. And I must admit to you that that was a very traumatic time for me because I, I didn't know who I was. I was lost. I didn't feel like I belonged. And even to make matters worse, my actual father, who was well off, uh, he didn't want nothing to do with me nor my sister and so I had major rejection issues from my father. And to be honest with you, that ate me up more than sexual, mental, verbal and physical abuse that I copped from my stepfather who was in and out of prisons and boys' homes most of his life. And the sad thing about that is at my greatest time of need, when my stepfather was violently bashing my mum, my dad was non-existent. He even sold our house uh, underneath our feet just because they were that greedy and we were left to live in a shed for about two months. And so going from place to place was quite normal now. And uh, to be honest with you, I didn't expect anything good for my life. I mean, you're talking about a guy that was so psychopathic. One night he tried to burn the house down while we were inside. So we've locked up the whole house, not realizing that this man was so jealous and such a control freak that he actually hid up in the roof for a week while we're in the house. The only way we found out that he was in the house because there was a stench coming from the roof. While we're out of the house through the day, he was actually up inside. He'd come down from the roof and actually take food back up. The food would go off and then the stench would come through the roof. And so you can imagine as a little boy, I was absolutely horrified. I was terrified. And the day that I walked in and seen him on top of my mum with a knife to her throat threatening to kill her, um, my mum was so traumatised by that event that she can't even actually remember um, that he'd done that to her. And I couldn't even remember how we got out of it that day. And, you know, we're talking about situations where we'd wake up through the night and we've got flames flickering through the windows because he's torched the car trying to burn the house down. The whole street shut down. And so it was such an embarrassment to be in my family. And so I started experimenting with uh, petrol uh, aerosol cans. I left my body when I was about 11 years old. I actually died and came back into my body because I just wanted to take anything or do anything that alleviated my pain and to get me away from the suffering that I was um, it, that was happening to me. And so I was into petrol aerosol cans. I started smoking marijuana. My uncles were dealers. My stepfather had criminal mates. And so I was just in this vicious cycle of crime and addiction. And so by the age of 16, you know, I was taking like e easy, swallowing 50 Valiums at a time. I'd go to the doctors myself, get my own Valium and Diazepam, my own scripts, and I'd be taking Diazepams as well. And my uncle was dealing uh, amphetamines at the time, and then he was on Endones, 
and he's also on Mogadone, so I was actually getting them off him as well. My mate was selling uh, Prolidones, which is synthetic heroin, it's equivalent to six endones. And so by the age of 16, I was an absolute raging bull. I OD'd that many times. I was on flip flip mix oil injections, hyperperidol injections, Valium injections, Medicaid injections. I was on so many injections and so much drugs, taking acid. I was even uh, shooting up morphine, taking morphine tablets. That at the age of 16, I OD'd that many times. They sent me to the second biggest mental institution in Australia, in Orange, just to dry me out. I was urinating on my friend's carpet. I was that far gone. I was roaming the streets for days talking to people that didn't exist, directing traffic, thinking I was uh, Jesus at one point. I don't know, I thought I was maybe a police officer. I didn't know what I thought I was. I'd be caught talking to vacuum cleaners, talking to people that were in the room. Um, and I didn't have a clue where I was, even to the point where I'm in my mate's house and I'm urinating on his carpet because I think I'm outside. That's how far gone I was. By the age of 19, I kept taking so much drugs that I ended up in seven drug induced comas. They tied me down like a wild animal and because uh, they couldn't control me because I was ODing on Cogentin, which is a side effect tablet for the injections that I was taking. And I was so angry that I started cutting myself up with knives, hacking my arms on fences. I've threatened to kill my mum a couple of times with knives. I've actually threatened to kill other people that have nearly died at, at, at the other end of my um, rage and anger and violence. And by the age of 19, I was like a 63 year old man spewing over myself for three days. And I was at the end of myself and I didn't have any hope, any way out. And I remember everyone tried to get me to go to church. Everyone tried to get me to know the Bible. Everyone wanted me to go to the prayer meeting. And to be honest with you, I knew I had issues, but I didn't know that I wanted to change my life. I just knew that I was a mess. And I knew that I didn't understand what was going on for me. But when this family took me in, my step uncle, I'll tell you the first time my, my introduction to the Bible, we were shooting up amphetamines and my uncle's preaching to me high as a kite on amphetamines. I don't know what your introduction was, but that was mine. That's how much I knew about the Bible. And so when I'm in Sydney, they're trying to get me to go to these groups. And this same uncle who was shooting up amphetamines, he's at the sink because he fried himself. He reckons the angels took him to Sydney. They've had enough of me. And they said, go and talk to him at the sink. So I go and have a chat to him. And he talks to me and he turns around and says, Mark, John 3, 3 says that no one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. Then he quoted John 3, 5. He said, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless he's born of water and spirit. And he quoted John 3, 16 to me. He said, God so loved this world that he gave his one and only son. Whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. And he said, Mark, he didn't come into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. And I must admit to you that up until that point, I didn't give a flying hoot of what these Christians tried to tell me. But something in my heart resonated with what he said. And it was truth that I never knew. And I went home on what they call a deadly treadly in Aboriginal. It's called me pushed by it. So I cruised home. I didn't even know biblical hermeneutics, homiletics. I knew nothing about the Bible. I hated schools. I dropped out. The only uh, magazine I read was porn mags and videos. You know what I'm saying? I, I had no, no desire at all to read. And as I got home, I opened the Bible and to the book of what I thought was Palms. I found out later it was the book of Psalms. That's how much <laughs> I knew about the Bible, right? So I opened it up and I'm, I'm trying to read because I want to know what this guy knows. And as I start reading down the page, I hit Psalms chapter 72, verse 14. And I didn't read the verse. The Lord uh, read the verse to me face to face up inside of my heart. He said, I'm going to rescue you from oppression, violence and fraud because precious is your blood in my sight. And I can tell you from that day onwards, it was not a smooth ride, but something had shifted in my heart. 